Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at the Farnborough International Air Show at this historic airfield about 30 miles southwest of London. One of the world's most important air shows with leaders from government, the military, industry, and aircraft from all around the world on this centenary year of the Royal Air Force, uh, the, the first independent air force founded in April 1918. Our coverage here is sponsored by Farnborough International and Leonardo DRS, and we're here on the Inspire stand uh, to talk to Hugh Griffiths, who is the chief executive of the company, uh, Lincoln-based, 137 highly innovative people trying to change flight training as we as we know it. Hugh, it's a pleasure seeing you again. It's a pleasure to see you too. Uh, thank you very much for coming to see us. Uh, we're having a great show here. Uh, there's a huge amount of stuff going on for us as a business. Uh, and you're absolutely right. We are trying to change the whole business model for defense in the UK by offering something completely different and revolutionary. Uh, and in fact, our, our, our motto is revolution in defense. That's what we're trying to actually create. Um, and, and it has been uh, extraordinary how rapidly you guys have gone from a small company in 2005 to being something, you know, you guys are in Lincoln, about an hour north of uh, London, uh, but have really sort of taken the industry by storm, not to like uh, falsely sort of butter you up at all, but talk to us a little bit about what the fundamental model of the company was. It was aviators who had a lot of combat experience who decided, look, let's change this, this game. I want to get into some programmatic specifics and competitions and things you guys are, are pursuing. But talk to us about sort of that game-changing model you guys came up with that has been so instrumental in your growth. Absolutely. So um, we're a very unusual business in that we were founded uh, with a specific mission and a specific vision in mind. So the company itself um, is basically 80, 75 to 80% former military air crew. And you will not find another business in the UK with that level of operational understanding of the operational environment. So essentially this is a business designed by aviators and for aviators with the aim of giving back to the military community which we see as our primary customers. Um, so we have, a, we have an unusual vision. Um, our vision is to become the most trusted and respected defense company on the planet. We were started 15 years ago by three aviators with 300 pounds and, and here we are now doing all sorts of stuff internationally um, it's, it's a pretty interesting success story and the reason it's been successful is because it really strikes a chord with our you know, military customers in the cockpit doing the actual job because we've kind of all done that too. So that is, it's an unusual model. Uh, and, and also we're quite, we're quite edgy as well. So there's something slightly anarchic about us which slightly unnerves the big primes. You know, we, we are right out there doing really quite you know, unusual stuff that you would normally expect big defense primes to be doing. So for example, we trained the British Army to fly the Apache attack helicopter, the Wildcat helicopter. We're doing all the human performance training for Royal Air Force pilots. We've sold our tablet internationally, Jordan, Indonesia. Um, it's in use on every British helicopter in Joint Helicopter Command. We've made a simulator that completely um, creates a new niche for simulators. It gives you 90% of the capability of a traditional all-moving simulator for about 10% of the cost. So it is, it is slightly revolutionary, and it comes back to revolution in defense. This is what we're about. Um, let's, let's go to some uh, contracts you guys are uh, pursuing. One is the ASDOT program. Tell us what that is, how you fit into it, and, and the, the, the itch that it's trying to scratch. So, so ASDOT is a program that's been um, conceived by the UK military to improve the ability of um, UK airborne um, and seaborne and, and to an extent land warfighters to, to try and um, provide them with an ability of something to train against. So essentially it's the creation of an adversary air training capability across air, land and sea. And um, we're bidding for it. Um, we formed a consortia, uh, which uh, we think is a very, very good consortia, uh, which is basically us, Inspire. Uh, we're, we're partnered with our two partners, Top Aces, uh, who are Canadians, uh, and uh, uh, Leonardo MW in the UK, who are um, the biggest element of that, of that consortia. And uh, we aim to provide, again, a, a revolutionary, um, interesting, unique, um, unusual solution to the MOD, the like of which they have not yet seen. So to help them train and prepare for war. Um, are you uh, willing, because it is a very competitive field, there are a lot of uh, established players in there as well as newer players, right? Draken is in there, Textron Systems, uh, or Textron Airborne, uh, I think, uh, if I recall, uh, uh, um, is, is in there. Um, you know, what do you guys think you're bringing to this equation that the other competitors don't have? So uh, the other competitors will, will all offer 
will all offer excellent solutions. Um, they're, they're, you know, we are very respectful of the other competitors and they will offer good solutions. What we are bringing is um, a powerful combination of three specific things. So in uh, Top Aces, you have um, an adversary air company that has an unmatched safety record that has something like 70,000 accident-free flight hours of delivering this type of training across the globe in Australia, in Germany, in Canada. Um, and they're all like us, former military aircrew. So we have that ability to do that in a very highly safety certified way. And safety is a big issue for them and it will be a big issue for the UK customer as well, you know, after various instances have happened over the last three or four years. So that, 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 that's what Top Aces will bring. We will bring a deep and tacit knowledge of the UK military environment. Uh, we are currently providing white force services to the UK Air Warfare Centre, to the Air Battle Space Training Centre. We already have reservists flying Typhoon. We have um, people flying Apache attack helicopters. You know, we are fully embedded in the warfighter environment for the UK military. And in Leonardo, we have a very well respected global prime with extremely innovative technology that will able to be able to sort of help us finance, de-risk, create innovative contracting solutions and, and deliver a program on time and on budget. That's, that's what we, we think we offer. I seem to have noticed there's a lot of discussion about this Brexit thing yes. uh, around, around the UK. Uh, in fact, the, uh, defense, uh, the Minister for Defence <laughs> Procurement, Guido Beb, who we interviewed on Monday, um, resigned uh, later that evening over, over, a, over a Brexit vote, so, so that was interesting. You guys are a UK company, but you're also a key contractor to the European Defence Agency uh, for some of your training uh, skills. Uh, it's at an RAF base here uh, in the UK in a corner of it with, that you're doing that mission now. Talk to us about how Brexit could affect your business, whether it's for that contract, um, you guys could, could move that. That's not the hard part. But does the potential change in relationship change, for example, the role you can play and, and cause you to adapt or change some of your strategic planning in order to expand your base over on the continent? So as regards Brexit, um, what's happened in the past is obviously what's happened. But from our perspective, it's not really going to make any big difference to us at all. Um, most, of our, uh, most of our costs are, um, mo most of our trade in the military sphere is not really with Europe at the moment. We are focusing primarily on the Far East and the Middle East. Um, we have suffered some, um, uh, some variations in costs because some of the stuff we buy is denominated in dollars. Uh, and uh, because of the weak pound, um, which has been, you know, as a result of the uncertainty about Brexit, uh, some of those costs have gone up for us. But on the other hand, the weak pound has made some of our exports cheaper. Mm -hmm. So on balance, it's kind of balanced out. I mean, looking forward, will this have a big effect on us? I don't really know. Um, as I say, right now, uh, we are not doing huge amounts in Europe. Um, and personally, my view is that companies like us, which are providing specialist military services will still be will still be able to, to make progress and operate in Europe I'm not quite sure what the customs tariffs and VAT and all the rest of it will be will be but I, I personally think it will be okay you know that's my view so. uh, you guys uh, you know as you said were born as an innovative company to scratch you know to solve a specific problem but then the overall model was one of innovate to solve all sorts of other problems yeah. and use that core and branch out yeah. from that core into different directions. Um, as the chief executive, as you look at it, and with a very, very talented uh, management team, some of whom also have a pretty good sense of humor, by oh, the very way. Good, yes, yeah. yeah, so at least they've got that going for you, Johnny Priest. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you intend to expand and to grow the business. You have great ambition, yes. but where, where are the other market segments that you can apply this sort of game changing approach to how you go about doing things? Where, where are you? Because you've got to pick your spots, obviously, yes. right? And uh, your edginess may annoy the big contractors, but the big contractors also have deep pockets and very big feet. So, uh, talk, talk to us about where and how you want to grow. You know, if you're looking at yourself five or 10 years from now, what are the kind of capabilities you think you'll have? How do you think you'll be able to change the game in other fields? Because I think that looking at what you guys have done and how quickly you've gone from tiny to big, very surprising for a lot of people. Yeah. How do you want to keep surprising people five to 10 years from now? So I think the very fact that we've grown so quickly means we've struck a chord with military customers in the UK. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have been successful. Um, I think there is plenty more business left in the UK for companies like us um, to exploit what we're already doing, which is employing highly tactically capable people 
um, in a military sense, you know, tactically capable military people to help give back as part of the whole force, which is this new model in the UK that military capability will be delivered by this mix of uniformed people, uh, full-time reserve, uh, full-time uniformed people, reservists and specialist contractors such as us. So I think we're going to press and increase our offering to the UK military. But also, you know, we are now looking increasingly overseas. We are exporting to the Far East. We are exporting to the Middle East. Uh, and we have global ambition. And, you know, the very things that we're offering here in the UK, um, they're, they're relevant elsewhere too. You know, and a lot of other countries are interested because we are now a serious provider to the UK military. So if we can provide the UK military, which is a very capable and very demanding customer, why would we be a not of interest to other companies too? Um, plus, of course, we are now looking at partnering with big primes, international primes, that perhaps can't do what we can do as well as we can. So we will get business off them as well, because it actually makes more sense for them to deal with us rather than try and recruit people themselves. Because quite frankly, most of our capability comes from our, our ability to recruit and retain the sort of people that deliver our services. And that's all down to values, ethos, and a particular culture that appeals to former military people. Well, wasn't there an instance where you beat a big prime and the big prime hired you guys to do work in another sector because you could do it cheaper than they could? Uh, there's been, there've been plenty of uh, incidences where we have gone head to head with other primes and then subsequently they've come back to us and you know used us and acknowledged the fact that actually we can do this much cheaper. Yes, absolutely. Now, but you, we're, I'm also talking about sort of broader growth, right? So you have your patch on the high fidelity simulation these kind of training environments, but where can you expand, as you look at your growth plan, it's not just doing what you do, but you guys are an innovation company. Yes. You're about changing different games, yes. and so what I want to get your thoughts on are, what are some of the other games that you're thinking about changing, whether it's in the training sphere, whether it's in the thinking sphere, you're laughing because I think you've got more up your sleeve than you even vaguely want to acknowledge, Hugh. <laughs> I'm not going to give all our secrets away, but we, you know, an innovative business is, there is more to an innovative business than a business that just makes a few innovative products or a few innovative services. You know, we have plenty of innovative products, we have innovative services, but a truly innovative business is a business that is innovative in everything it does, it, from the design of its office to the way it operates its leave policy. So here's an example. Uh, in our business, we have an uncapped paid leave policy. Now, that seems kind of crazy to people in big primes because they assume everybody will take advantage of it. But actually, in our business, nobody takes advantage of it because this is a business based on trust. It's based on the idea that if you are willing and able to trust somebody in a military world, why would you not do so in a civilian world? So, you know, we, we have very few appraisals in the company because we consider them to be a, a waste of time because, quite frankly, all good leaders interact with their people on a daily basis. So what on earth are you going to get out of you know, an annual appraisal with a you know, thousand tick boxes you have to fill in. So my, my view would be, we will continue to operate our business in a very innovative way, in a slightly anarchic way, in a slightly edgy way. Uh, that will attract people who, who are attracted to that sort of thing. And, that, and they will help us look at new solutions. Now where we're going, we've now got into the UAV space, um, the unmanned space, and we are building up quite a capability there. We're in cyber. Uh, we're building a capability there. You know, we're thinking about moving into the space world. Uh, we have quite a lot of little niche areas. We've moved into intelligence. So th there's a lot of niche areas which call for people with expert tacit domain knowledge. And most of these types of people do not want to work for the big primes. They want to work for a company that recognizes how they think, what they value, what's important to them. And that's us. So one of, the, uh, one of the examples of how we're trying to revolutionize and innovate is uh, the creation of what we've called a targeted fidelity simulator, which you did a very good report on some time back. Now, um, that's right, we were at DSCI and we, had right. a, we talked to Johnny at the that's, time. That's right. Now, um, so we've made this thing and, and we can go and have a look at it, but it offers you 90, 90% of the capability of a traditional all moving hydraulic or electric jack simulator for about 10% of the price. And you know, in, a, in, a, in an environment where there is a extreme pressure on defense budgets because societal changes mean that people are actually less interested in defense because they generally don't see the threat and they'd rather the money was spent on other things that are perceived as societally more valuable, this actually means that we can, we can offer something that's in tune with that. Um, you know, 
pretty much the same capability, minus a little bit, but for an absolute fraction of the price. And I, I think you know that sort of um, slightly uh, sort of um, undercutting anarchic approach is going to become more and more prevalent. But it, it does take generally a small SME to take the risk to develop that sort of thing because we own all the risk. You know, in a big prime, what you tend to have is t to get big investment decisions, you need to get the approval of multiple layers of management. And that generally takes a great deal of time and effort. Whereas, you know, we, there's 140 of us, 137 of us in this business, and we all work together and we can make decisions very, very quickly. We take risks, we really do, because we have to, and we're extremely patient to get the return. So this particular simulator we've been working on for three or four years, which for us is a long time, but you know, already we have a market for it. So that's just an example. Um, so let me ask you one last question. So as you look at the evolution of the global threat environment, right? You have great powers that want to win without fighting. Yes. Um, there is a greater focus, for example, on strategic rocketry as opposed to air forces. Uh, right, we have our model because we were successful with that model. We built stealth fighters to drop bombs, uh, precision bombs. We used long-range stealthy airplanes to drop dumb, dumber or, or short-range weapons. The other guy said, hey, I can't do that. That's expensive and the training is very expensive. We're going to go with rockets in a box, for example. So everybody is looking to outthink the other guy, Correct. right? Use misinformation, for example, as a strategic weapon. Uh, maybe even win over a foreign leader, ultimately, in the process of that exchange. As you look, uh, as an intelligent uh, former physicist, as you look at this space, how do you think warfare is changing? How do you think conflict is changing? As you work as an innovative company to position yourself in an ecosystem that's very much changing, because there are a lot of guys who look at where all of us are and wonder whether or not everybody is thinking correctly about what actually the problems are going to be five or 10 years hence, and whether the right kinds of capabilities are being f built five or 10 years hence. So as somebody who's thoughtful and looking at that market, what do you see when you look out there and where you what and an everybody's got to be? What an interesting question. I mean, I, I, there will definitely be very significant changes in the military space uh, over the next 10 to 15 years. Some of the things that um, I see having a really big impact are things that we're seeing in retail and banking, which, you know, things like blockchain, okay? Uh, what is the implication of blockchain to military operations? You know, the underlying ideas behind Bitcoin and stuff like that, you know, where you have distribution of um, confirmation of, 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 of authenticity and stuff like that. What, what, what's the implication of that? What about the rise of artificial intelligence? You know, how's that going to work? I heard recently somebody tell me whether it's right or wrong, I don't know, that within 10 to 15 years, 70 to 80 percent of all jobs could be done better by a machine. Whether they will be or not is another thing. But you know, what's the implications of that for, for, uh, for the military going forward? What about the implications of very sophisticated encryption? So maybe it will become possible to um, to encrypt things so well that nobody can ever decrypt them. But then against that, what about the rise of you know, quantum computing and the ability to deploy massive computing power against problems? Um, stealth, um, stuff like that. Some very, very interesting technologies I think will, be, will become very important. I also think there'll be some very interesting societal changes you know, amongst people and what they think of the militaries. You know, what, the generation from which I am from, which you know, was not really being involved in the great, you know, has got a history of being involved in the Cold War, but succeeded that, you know, the Second World War. The new generation, the youngsters coming through now, will think differently about military capabilities, will place different uh, importance on, on, the, on the military. You know, are we talking less and less about, um, you know, dropping bombs on people and more and more about cyber? Uh, are we talking more about, um, unusual ways of achieving the same sort of thing. The honest truth is, I don't know where it's going to go, but whichever way it goes, it's going to be an extremely interesting ride, and small innovative businesses need to be at the front of that, because generally they can move so much quicker than large primes. Historically, there are a lot of companies that start with, like you guys, very excited, uh, innovative, we're changing the business model, and in an X number of years, one of the big primes acquires you, gobbles you up, and then the company fundamentally changes. Uh, the guys at the top yes. maybe get a very, very nice uh, package, 
uh, and then move on and either try to launch a new thing or, or continue in, the, in, in what becomes a very, very different company. From your guys' standpoint, is this a financial play that you launched in, in 05, you're growing it to a certain level in order to become merger and acquisition fodder at some point? Or are you looking at it and staying in this business as an independent and continuing, you know, and, and is that something your shareholders are going to allow if they see somebody come in with a very, very big offer and try to buy you guys out? So, I mean, all businesses go through different stages in their evolution. Uh, we are here to create our revolution in defense and to try and achieve the things that we want to achieve. Um, yes, we do have external shareholders. And yes, at some point, they probably will want to exit and we will probably get new shareholders in. So that is an, ine an inevitability. But we have no intention of allowing the fundamental culture, values, and ethos of this business to be undermined because that is the, the foundation on which everything is built. Um, so uh, I'm not saying that there will never be you know, um, other shareholders of our business. Um, of course there will be at some point in its life, but we will be very, very careful about who those people are. And, and quite frankly, unless they support what the management actually wants, um, I would very much doubt that they would get any management or employee support. And if they don't get that, then frankly those those potential acquirers are not going to be interested in buying in the first place if they've got any sense. So uh, we see this continuing. I see myself continuing in the role as chief executive, I hope. <laughs> and, and, you know, we've got work to do. Uh, and we're trying to change defense. We're trying to change the defense industrial space. Uh, and, and, you know, there are some advantages to um, extra investment and stuff like that. I mean, it gives us more muscle. Um, and, you know, we mustn't overlook the, the good things that can come from having a, a big, muscly supporter that can help you with some stuff, because there's only so much we can do with our current size. But we are jealously going to guard those culture, ethos, values, ways of doing things, freedom of operation, trust, that sort of thing. And, and how many people and how much money are you going to be at, say, in another 10 years? What's your turnover going to look like and how many people are you going to have? So um, that's, a really, that's a really difficult question. I mean, And I'm going to hold you to it in 10 years, by the way, Hugh. Um, I, 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 yeah, in 10 years' time, I'm determined this business will still be here. It will still be doing the same sort of things it is. I suspect it will be much bigger. I suspect it will be split into some smaller units. Um, I think um, how big will we be, hard to say. Um, in terms of people, we've grown from three to 140 odd people in about 10 years. Um, I think that rate of growth will increase, so I could see it at least doubling, possibly tripling. Um, I don't think it'll be ever more than about four or 500 people because there are simply not the people out there with the level of tacit knowledge and skills that we need. Um, it's very much based on military operational experience. So that's in terms of numbers. In terms of size and finance, uh, financial numbers, I mean, this year we've doubled our EBITDA on last year, which is pretty impressive. Um, next year we're forecasting our EBITDA going up by about 60 or 70 percent. Um, I think we are about to start climbing a very rapid growth as people latch on to the fact that, hang on a minute, here is a business that is offering something fundamentally different to what already exists. You know, this is new, it's different, it's not the same, and quite a lot of people want a bit of that. And what was your EBITDA number? Are you uh, uh, open to share it? I'd rather not share that. <laughs> Thank you. Hugh Griffiths, uh, the chief executive of Inspire, uh, one of the most innovative companies here at this show, and I'm not just, not just saying that. Uh, thanks very much for all your time. Looking forward to seeing you guys and would love to come up to Lincoln. Uh, 137 guys in an innovative office space. As a former manager, I can't tell you how much how stupid filling out forms in terms of doing appraisals are and how incredibly limiting. You know, If you're going to trust your team, for them to do well. To micromanage them on leave uh, is, is just an idiotic policy. So well done, all the best to you guys for your growth and look forward to seeing you again soon. Great pleasure to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye bye.